Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum students. Uh, we are done with the mineral corticoids and now uh, we are starting the glucocorticoids. And uh, in this lecture, we will cover the topics mechanism of action of cortisol. We know that the principal glucocorticoid is the cortisol. And actions of cortisol on carbohydrates, proteins, and fat metabolism, role of cortisol in adaptation to stress, and anti inflammatory effects of cortisol. Okay. Uh, now, the cortisol, it, it accounts for about 95% of all glucocorticoid activity. And um, glucocorticoid, as the name indicates, uh, it is important uh, for glucose, metaboli uh, glucose metabolism as well as proteins and lipid metabolism. And glucocorticoids, they are essential for response to stress. Uh, they exhibit a rhythm which is called circadian rhythm, um, which states that uh, the cortisol levels, they are highest in the morning uh, for people who sleep at night. Cortisol levels, they are highest in the morning and they are lowest in the evening, that is at 12 at night. And cortisol, it binds with the cortisol binding globulin, which is also called uh, transcortin. Okay, now what is the mechanism of action? As we all know that uh, glucocorticoid, they are the lipophilic hormones, so they readily diffuses across the plasma membrane and the receptor for the glucocorticoid is present in the cytoplasm. The hormone comes, it binds with the receptor, hormone receptor complex is formed, it goes inside the nucleus, and here they interact with the hormone response element. And in case of glucocorticoid, the hormone response element is called glucocorticoid response element. There are certain proteins which are called transcription factors, and uh, they are also important for the appropriate interaction of the hormone re receptor complex with the glucocorticoid response element. And then they increase or decrease the transcription of genes to alter the synthesis of messenger RNA. We will see that what are the uh, various effects of glucocorticoids. First of all, the effect of cortisol on carbohydrate metabolism. Uh, the very first effect is the stimulation of gluconeogenesis. Gluconeogenesis, gluco means glucose, neo means new, and genesis means production. So gluconeogenesis is the production of the new glucose. And cortisol does it by uh, increasing the enzymes, which is required to convert the amino acids into the glucose in liver cells. Uh, you must remember that uh, cortisol, they stimulate hepatic gluconeogenesis by conversion of the amino acids into the glucose. So uh, it also, uh, uh, in addition to the uh, increase in the enzymes, it also increases the mobilization of amino acids from extra hepatic tissue, mainly from the muscles. So uh, when the amino acids they are mobilized, there will be increased amino acids in the plasma, which enter in the liver cells to take part in the gluconeogenesis. And as we know that during fasting, uh, when the glycogen stores, uh, they are used up. Uh, glycogen is broken down into the glucose. Glycogen, we all know that it is stored in the liver. So when glycogen is broken down into the glucose, so it's very important that uh, gluconeogenesis is very important uh, factor which replenishes the stores of the glycogen. And uh, also the blood glucose level will be maintained at a certain level, uh, which is also very important for the brain because brain can only use glucose uh, and not, uh, I mean, uh, glycogen is not stored in the brain. So it can only use glucose. So it's very important that blood glucose level should be maintained at a certain level. Uh, cortisol also, it decreases glucose utilization by all cells except the brain. And um, both these processes, that is gluconeogenesis and decreased glucose utilization, uh, it will result in the increased blood glucose level. And when the blood glucose level is increased, there will be the uh, stimul stimulus for the release of the insulin. And uh, cortisol, it also causes insulin resistance. 
uh, in many tissues. So uh, insulin cannot do its work because the tissues, they are resistant to the stimulatory effects of the insulin. And all these effects together, increased blood glucose level plus the insulin resistance, it will result in the uh, condition which is called adrenal diabetes, that is blood glucose level will rise so much that diabetes will occur and it is due to the increase in the cortisol level. So this case, the diabetes is called adrenal diabetes. And in adrenal diabetes, if we administer insulin, it will lower blood glucose to a very small extent because there is insulin resistance. Okay. Now, what is the effect of cortisol on protein metabolism? Uh, cortisol, it decreases the protein stores in all tissues except the liver. So, it decreases uh, the protein stores by two processes. First, it increases protein catabolism, especially in the muscle. So, when the protein is broken down, uh, it will convert into the amino acids. And also, there is decreased protein synthesis in extrahepatic tissue. It's because uh, cortisol decreases transport of amino acids in extrahepatic tissue. So, uh, it reduces protein elsewhere in the body except in the liver. As you can see, in the liver, cortisol increases liver and the plasma proteins because plasma proteins are also formed in the liver. So, it increases these proteins. Why? Because it enhances the transport of amino acids into the liver cells. Here, uh, there must be no confusion that cortisol increases the uh, transport of amino acids into the liver cells, so it increases the protein synthesis in liver. And it decreases the transport of amino acids in extrahepatic tissue. Also, it depresses the synthesis of messenger RNA in extrahepatic tissue, so it decreases protein synthesis here. Okay. Now, the effect on the fat metabolism, it increases lipolysis. Lysis means breakdown. So, lipids are broken down, which increases the concentration of free fatty acids in the plasma. Also, it causes oxidation of fatty acids and uh, the mobilized fatty acids. And they, are then, they are available as an alternate source of energy uh, for the tissues. And in, uh, instead of glucose, so glucose, uh, they are spared. Glucose is spared for the uh, use of brain. Brain can utilize glucose and the other tissues, for other tissues, uh, fatty acids, they are available for energy. Okay. Uh, now, what, uh, how is the obesity uh, caused by the cortisol? This is the important university question. That excess cortisol secretion causes a particular type of obesity with deposition of fat in the chest and head region, giving like a buffalo-like torso and a rounded moon face. And obesity results from the increased food intake and the fat deposited in some tissues more rapidly than it is mobilized. So fat is deposited in the head and the chest region rather than it is mobilized and giving like a, a buffalo-like torso and a rounded moon face. Okay. Now, what is the permissive action of the cortisol? Cortisol is extremely important for its permissiveness. Uh, for example, cortisol must be present in adequate amounts to permit catecholamines to induce vasoconstriction. We know that catecholamines are epinephrine and norepinephrine, and their function is the vasoconstriction, narrowing of the blood vessels. So, cortisol. Uh, must be present in adequate amounts for the catecholamines to uh, induce the vasoconstriction. And a person lacking cortisol, if untreated, may go into shock uh, in stressful situation um, that demands immediate vasoconstriction. Okay, and the stress, and what is the role in adaptation to stress? Uh, stress of any kind whether it's a trauma or uh, any kind of stress, uh, it is a major stimulus for increased cortisol secretion. Cortisol plays a key role in adaptation to stress. Uh, let's take an example that if a person is facing some critical condition or um, uh, he must go 
uh, for eating. So cortisol, it provides a pool of glucose, amino acids and fatty acids to combat with the uh, critical condition of the patient. Um, it uh, provides glucose. So the blood glucose level we have studied, uh, that blood glucose level will be maintained. So the glucose can be used by the brain and um, proteins, they are broken down and amino acids, concentration of amino acids is increased, which causes repair of the tissues. And also fatty acids are available for the alternative source of energy. So uh, it has an extremely important role in combating with the stressful conditions. Okay. Uh, now, what is the anti-inflammatory effects? Cortisol also has a very important anti-inflammatory effects. It can um, block early stages of inflammation, even before the inflammation starts, or even if the inflammation has started. So it increases the healing process. And, and these are the certain uh, points uh, which you should remember that cortisol stabilizes membranes of lysosomes. We know that proteolytic enzymes they are present in the lysosomes and um, in the damaged cells. Uh, these enzymes they are released to cause inflammation. So cortisol this stabilizes the membranes of lysosomes. So the proteolytic enzymes they are not released. Also, it decreases the permeability of capillaries, which reduces the loss of plasma into the tissues. Uh, cortisol decreases the migration of white blood cells into the inflamed area, and also it decreases the phagocytosis of damaged cells. Uh, because uh, it does it uh, probably because it decreases the production of uh, prostaglandins. Um, also, then. Um, it decreases the uh, T lymphocyte production. Uh, so there will be the suppression of immune response. Uh, cortisol decreases fever because it reduces the release of interleukin-1 from WBCs. Um, also, cortisol uh, has a very important role in the treatment of the diseases which have chronic inflammation because it has very important anti-inflammatory effects. So it is uh, given in the diseases like uh, rheumatoid arthritis, rheumatic fever, or acu acute glomerulonephritis. Um, among the other effects of cortisol, it, that it um, increases the production of RBCs. So whenever there is increased cortisol, there will be polycythemia. And when there is no cortisol, there will be anemia. Cortisol also decreases the eosinophils and the lymphocytes. So, um, uh, a finding of lymphocytopenia and eosinopenia is also important. Okay, this was all about today's lecture. Thank you so much, students.